Welcome to another Lucid. We have a really great show for you tonight, and as you probably read, this is going to be the last Lucid in the current format until September 5th. We're taking the summer to try out some new things. You'll be informed about it. Hopefully you'll come with us. And uh, if not, then you come back on September 5th and we'll have a great new lineup for you and lots of fun stuff. So, but before we get there, we have a terrific, terrific uh, showcase. And our first speaker, I'm going to actually read what I wrote because uh, it's out of my uh, comfort zone. So uh, he is an entrepreneur, a technologist who has developed projects at the intersection of media, tech, and data in over 26 countries. He travels all over the world to help local citizens create active civil societies through media, performance, and citizen journalism. He's a co-founder and advisor to uh, Digital Democracy. He's been uh, featured on Al Jazeera, NPR, and uh, he's testified before Congress. And Mark, you need to help them a little bit because they, they need it, especially in this field. And uh, he has recently uh, formed a, a film and production company called New Words Media. I'd like to introduce Mark Belinsky talking about how not to die using technology in a dictatorship. Mark Belinsky. All right, thanks so much. Uh, Please give a round of applause to the Ian Baguette trio. Those guys were awesome. Uh, they're the real musicians. I'm not actually a musician, but you'll see why I'm holding a guitar in a second. Ta-da. <laughs> All right, so um, I started uh, a technology called Songyoki. So basically, I'm going to sing and play some, some chords, and it should... Uh, if it works, this isn't a real demo, but uh, it should come up with the song. Um, so. Scream, scream with me. Moments like this never last. When do creatures scratch your face? Hybrids open up the door. Saying if it was actually working, that would come up. So, ooh, baby, when you cry, your face is momentary. And then, if that was actually working, it would probably get taken down by the FBI. <laughs> because I'm infringing on a number of copyrights from the misfits and whoever owns their songs and all of this. So, the, the problem is that they're not the... The FBI is not the only group uh, in the world that actually has these kinds of notices. There's, um, it's, it looks pretty good. It has a lot of seals. Um, you know, this one is from uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, much less attractive. The Saudis, they really do not have a style when it comes to uh, their takedown notices. But the United Arab Emirates, they have a really cute warning. They, they take down information from the internet and they say, this is for your own safety. We, your government, have deemed this inappropriate and dangerous, hostile content. Uh, so we've taken it down. And this is the representative of their government that, that comes up and speaks with you. Um, so now, my family fled to this country as refugees from the Soviet Union. So I'm very interested personally in how freedom is expressed under closed societies. Now, technology is the new way that freedom is being expressed and yet it's being repressed in all sorts of different ways. And the censorship that occurs in this country is a lesson that's learned and replicated in other countries in, in more dangerous scenarios. And so the question that I want to pose when we talk about how to not die in a dictatorship is what is our responsibility here as Americans and, and otherwise cool foreigners who are hanging out in New York or working in New York or otherwise. I'm a New Yorker, so I have that New York pride. But what is our responsibility as uh, people who are not, hopefully, not threatened uh, with their lives uh, while using and engaging in these technologies? So the first technology I want to talk about is Google. Now, Google is actually pretty good when it comes to technologies because they are transparent about um, what it is they're doing with our information and, and how much governments are asking Google for data. Right? All of us live our lives on Google. We have our credit card numbers there. We have our full contact list there. We have our mother's names there. And we have locations there. Now, um, 
However, Google at least is telling us how many times foreign governments are asking for our information and how much they're actually complying with foreign law and, and giving up that data. Right, so the US leads by far with requests. Uh, they asked last year for 5,950 uh, individual people's files. And Google uh, gave it to them 93% of the time. Like, that's pretty astonishing. Like, why isn't it 100? There's probably a good story there, and I hope that some journalists will go out and find out. Right, uh, Chile asked for um, 118 files and got about 42% compliance. And yet, Russia and Turkey uh, asked 42 times, and uh, Turkey, I think, was 92 times, and they complied with the Turkish and Russian authorities 0% of the time. Um, so that's kind of a very powerful story, and, and great to see Google standing up to countries that you may or may not want them to give information to, but at least they're explicit about it. Other groups are not as explicit. Now, this is what an email that I send looks like, because my emails have encryption. So when Google sees my emails, that's all they see. They see a bunch of gobbledygook. Now, in the 1990s, this was actually considered to be a weapon of mass destruction. I would have been arrested by putting this on the screen because it's very, very dangerous. Uh, thankfully, there was a fight to make sure that this was not a weapon of mass destruction. And because of that, we now have secure online banking. That's how you encrypt the connection between you and your bank so that you know that nothing uh, that you say to your bank is intercepted by anybody else, right? However, other groups don't have those kinds of standards, right? If you're talking with Gmail or with Google, you and Google are having this conversation and they can decide who else will get the information. But if you have Yahoo Mail, every message you're sending is like a postcard. Right? Anybody who wants to can just see what you're sending if they want to. It's not in an envelope, which is what it would be like if you have encryption. And yet people don't know this when they're engaging in these technologies. And the companies themselves, who you think would have the best interests of their users in mind, whether here or in a dictatorship, really don't. And that's pretty scary to me. Now, I really love this guy. This is an Android. He has a terrible name, and I don't know why Google decided that their phone operating system is going to be called Android, but the beauty of it is that it's open source. And so for me, I say that there's actually a democracy in the code, because the code itself is open and visible. So the code is transparent, participatory, and accountable, right? And the conversation is uh, Google is free as in free as in beer. Coders love beer, so they like to put that in all their analogies. Um, but it's also free as in speech, right? Because you can actually see if there's some wrong, something wrong in the code and tweak it and improve it, right? So you get to really take ownership over these tools. Now, other tools are free as in beer, like Facebook, but they're not free as in speech because only Mark Zuckerberg and some other people have control over what Facebook does. Now, Facebook is an extraordinary tool, and you can see this man protesting in Tahrir Square in Egypt, um, showing his love for Facebook, which helped as a crucial piece of the revolution, but of course not nearly the only piece. Um, and what I like to, to um, say is this, the story of the people who did risk and sacrifice their lives in Egypt um, wonderfully encapsulated it, to me at least, in a, in a short quote saying, we used Facebook to schedule the protests, Twitter to coordinate, and YouTube to tell the world. And now when people are risking their lives and talking about their risking their lives using these American technologies or these digital tools, I'm like, well, what's the responsibility of these tools? And so uh, this was the Facebook page that was the organization. Uh, we are all Khalid Saeed, who was uh, the flashpoint of the revolution. He um, sacrificed his life and was the rallying call uh, where all the Egyptians came together and said, we are all Sa Khalid Saeed. We have all been taken for a ride by this government. We cannot actually live our lives. Uh, we are impoverished. Um, and this is the guy who put up the, uh, the Facebook page, right? Like a pretty cute icon, but importantly, you can't tell who he is. Now that violates uh, Facebook's terms of use. You have to be explicit about who you are. So while they were getting tens of thousands of users signed up for this revolution, Facebook shut it down. 
Like, sorry, this is by an anonymous user, so you can't have your revolution. And he was a Google executive, so he had some, str he could pull some strings. So he pulled some strings, got it back online, put his real name on there, and was imprisoned the next day. And attacked in the jails of Mubarak's regime and assaulted until he was finally released. Uh, thankfully not a martyr to, to the revolution, but uh, certainly a, a rallying flashpoint. So what is the responsibility as we start thinking about these uh, terms of use? And why would you have control over um, such an important flashpoint in history? What, what governs that control, right? What I love is uh, examples of actually using technologies that are so robust that they actually protect their users. And so when the internet was shut down in Egypt because the, it was seen by the regime as a rallying point for this revolution, the only tool that was actually able to get Facebook and Twitter messages out to allow people to continue to coordinate was Hootsuite because it was backed up enough that people were able to still use it. And so it's this redundancy that allows for a company to continue to get users, gain users. They saw a 9,000% increase in users that month. Um, so a pretty fantastic uh, upswing despite difficult circumstances or possibly because of it. Now, when Facebook has the third largest population in the world, <laughs> if it was a country, these are pretty crucial things to, uh, to be considering. Um, and yet, the mobile phones that we all have and rely on are the least secure technology that we have. So I want to do a quick survey. Who currently has a cell, who, who currently does not have a cell phone within six inches of them? So one guy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, hats off to him. Um, so this is a message by the armed forces after the revolution saying, hey, revolution's over, we won, go home. <laughs> that every single Egyptian got daily, right? Um, now, on the flip side, that same armed forces not only can send messages, but can track every person that signed up with their passport and identify them and take them from their homes. So I've actually been devoting a lot of my life to building the technologies to uh, resist this, to allow the continued freedom, uh, free flow of information, and working with Guardian Project to do just this. Um, and other technologies are pretty crucial as well. We saw the Iranian revolution where the regime did not fall, it continued. Um, and this is a woman who was, was shot and again was a rallying cry. Uh, uh, this is taken from a YouTube video. Um, she was the rallying cry of that revolution as people started to uh, continue to flood the streets to, to fight for her uh, honor. Um, but after the revolution, the government decided to do a funny thing and crowdsource repression. So they took all the pictures on Flickr and circled all the faces and said, can you, trusted citizen, identify the people in this photo in all of these photos so that we can more efficiently and effectively jail the people that have stood up against this regime. That was my reaction. <laughs> um, so the question is with these tools and these technologies, who, how much rights are we giving up as we take photos of large crowds, as we, we take photos in protests? Who's gaining access to that? And what technologies do we have to um, protect ourselves. So one of the tools that uh, Guardian Project is building that I've been working on is called ObscuraCam. And the idea is that it blurs everybody's photos unless you explicitly uh, give permission to have your photo taken. Uh, in more extreme human rights circumstances, it will actually encrypt the, the photo so that if a judge needs to see the, the picture, um, the trusted source, only two people uh, it's hard to explain encryption easily. So um, instead of just blurring the face, you can send the, the image and only one person on the other end, a trusted member, would be able to unencrypt that face, uh, who would then be able to use it, say, in the Court of Justice, at the UN, at the ICC, and use it for prosecution. But otherwise, you're saving your privacy, your identity. And currently, we're seeing tons of photos coming out of Syria, all with people's faces completely exposed. And this is a, a constant ongoing battle. 
Um, and one that's actually been pretty heinous. Uh, not only are the Syrian authorities potentially targeting their own citizens, but targeting foreigners as well. Uh, Murray Colvin no, no, was notoriously killed several months ago, potentially because her satellite phone was giving off an unencrypted message so that she could be identified, targeted, and killed. So she, as a journalist, was also um, at risk for covering the story, for helping to get the word out about what's happening uh, inside the country. Now, I don't want to be too negative, and I want to say that there, there are options in all of these, uh, opportunities to actually build creative solutions. So this is an internet in a suitcase, right? A mesh network, so that rather than having to call, if I want to call anybody in this room, I would have to call to outer space first, and then it would call you. Right? A mesh network would just use all of our phones to then connect the calls. Right? Much more efficient, environmentally friendly, you don't have to send anything into space, um, and much more robust, harder to close down. However, again, it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure, are these technologies being built? Are there any barriers to, be, to building them? Uh, what are the issues at hand? Um, and we're not doing particularly well. Uh, right now, the NSA is building the largest system of uh, information aggregation and storage in the world, allowing many other governments to say, well, we're going to start storing and, and gaining access to information. Uh, so yeah, 1.7 billion emails, phone calls, texts uh, per day, pretty shocking. This was not found out by Congress, who actually asked the NSA and received from the NSA an answer of, we're not going to tell you. This is an NSA whistleblower who said, the technologies that I built to battle the Soviet Union are now being turned on American citizens. And so I quit the NSA and I tell you all this because we're not telling Congress. So pretty terrifying scenario. Um, and a lot of the technologies that are currently out there are being built with these massive back doors. Uh, Skype has in China a version called Tom Skype, which has a complete back door so that the Chinese government can intercept any Skype calls between any of its citizens. So our answer to this is creating Ostel, which is encrypted voice communication technology. So one of the beauties of BBM and BlackBerry, uh, may they rest in peace, uh, <laughs> is that all the BBM messages were encrypted. And so business people loved this. They could travel anywhere in the world and make sure that nobody was going to intercept their business texts. However, that's not necessarily happening with their emails and certainly not happening with their voice communications. So the benefits of these technologies to me is not only helping people in the most desperate situations, it's also helping business people just do their work better. And techno technology companies have been failing miserably. Sony, you'd think the Japanese have been pretty good with technology for a long time. PlayStation had 70 million users, emails, locations, names, credit cards leaked, 70 million. But thankfully, it's only our children. <laughs> now, the media reports on this and says, hackers have stolen 70 million users' names, and blah, 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 blah. A technologist reads that and says, wow, Sony didn't have basic security standards in place. And they compromised all of our information. So even the narratives that we hear about these uh, ha crazy hackers to me, are really very dangerous for all of these reasons. Um, here's another uh, tool called Path, where people start to install this as the next best thing from Facebook, uh, next to Facebook. But it was getting access to your entire contact list and just storing it on their servers. And so the, the financial blowback of when people found this out and stopped installing the app, huge. How do we build technologies that are a bit smarter than that? Now. Who plays Angry Birds? Love the Angry Birds. Um, the problem with Angry Birds is they also have access to your entire contact list. Now, why does a little video game have access to your entire contact list? I have no idea. <laughs> they don't on an Android, they only have it on an iPhone. So on an Android, every app that you install says, hey, I'm gonna use your camera, I'm gonna use your location, I'm gonna use your contact list, they tell you, Sorry, this app is gonna use all of this. And so Angry Birds didn't ask for your contact list. But iPhone and other tools, you know, 
come on in, we'll let you do anything. Uh, and to me, that's kind of crazy. What was it? Uh, Fandango yesterday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it asked me to update my Fandango app, and it said, do you allow it to record audio? I said, why do I need it to record audio if I'm purchasing movie tickets? That's really pretty scary. So, no, not good. Uh, I don't want it. And I want to pose a challenge, actually, to say New York coders can be better, right? New York can have the best coders in the world. We have the subways where the internet doesn't work. And so actually we have more robust technologies that are used in more third world countries. We have Dropbox and Foursquare and TweetDeck and Tumblr, things that are natively built to, not work, when the, uh, to work when the internet's not working. Now, how can we also make sure that we're not gonna have the physical blowback of people dying when they're engaging in these technologies? I think New York coders are up to it. And hopefully it can be open source. Because even though the technology is democratic, free and open source, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a business model behind it. Uh, this is Red Hat Linux. It runs most every business in the world. It's enterprise solution uh, software that manages large data centers. Um, and they just broke a uh, billion dollars of revenue, uh, yearly revenue, as the first free and open source uh, company to do it. And even though they're free and open source and right out there, they still figured out a way to monetize themselves uh, while protecting business users all around the world and really, in my opinion, um, benefiting humanity. And to me, instead of teaching a lesson to kids that you're going to have all of your information stolen or um, another thing that we're teaching kids is that you can start sending naked pictures of your friends to other people. Uh, there was a recent Pew survey that said that one in 10 kids has sent a sext of themselves and one in four has sent one of their friends. So we're teaching them that privacy really doesn't matter while we're also making them all felons because they're trafficking child pornography. And the NSA is aggregating all that information so that in the future, if they ever want to prosecute you, they can prosecute you for any sort of reason, but they have always have the child porn records. Um, so instead, I want to say we can grab the bull by the horns and start teaching lessons to really uh, have the moral codes and the ethical codes of the 21st century. So this is one example that I like to use, which is uh, Google before you tweet is the new think before you speak. <laughs> right, just these good aphorisms. To, uh, to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and thinking about the technologies and the consequences rather than just diving into the deep end of the pool. So um, that's most of my talk, and I'd love to open it up for, uh, for Q&A. So I know what you're all thinking. Where's he gonna go on his tour with the guitar, right? Where's he gonna play next? Uh, there's a question. I like Google before you tweet, but I don't know what it means. What, what should people be Googling before tweeting? Um, to me, that's, that's one example of spreading of rumors and disinformation, which can be really dangerous. People will see something and then spread it like wildfire. We've seen massacres happen because of that, stampedes happen because of that. Um, it's just being more thoughtful before engaging. Um, so, Google before you tweet is very specifically like, use this company before that company, but the, the overarching ethic because they become verbs as, uh, is, is to me really important. I was gonna ask, uh, the way you talked about cell phones, so you, you could send like a text and it would go through all of our cell phones to somebody else or it would use our cell phones as sort of the network to get there. Is there something set up, does that work with computers? Like if, you know, we can get rid of this sort of global internet, like going to space and network between computers uh, to like send messages or like work the internet that way? Um, I mean, in, in theory, there, there are different ways. Uh, yes, um, the way that self, I was talking about cell phones being a, a mesh infrastructure so that they could uh, communicate with each other rather than having to use centralized systems of communication. Is there a way that uh, computers can do that? I think there, there's sort of different tiers of answers to that. So one is just supercomputing. Uh, right now, most of your computers are probably already doing this with viruses. 
that um, are installed by foreigners who then use your computers all to then be in their botnet uh, as little zombies to attack bigger websites or crack codes, things like that. Um, there are also ones that are used for scientific purposes. But uh, technically, Mesh is still being worked on and hopefully will be a place where we, we get to shortly. There are a lot of difficulties in that. Let's take one more question. I don't mean a lot of your computers, maybe just some. <laughs> My computer. Didn't uh, Samantha's riots in uh, London, where her wife's career happened a year ago, didn't uh, uh, Mesh get into the flash mob of riots managed to invade the police all the time because they stuck to Blackberry messaging and stayed off the internet because really they didn't have the infrastructure to it? Am I correct with that? So, so the question was about the, uh, the London riots being organized via VBM so the police weren't able to stop them. Um, very much so, that was, uh, the coordination was enabled via VBM. People were coordinating riots via those texts and the police don't have access to those texts. Um, they said that the solution to future rioting would be to open up those texts and start um, arresting the people who were rioting, uh, in, in my opinion. They've been dealing with riots decades before we had cell phones, and they should just be better at being police. Or there, there's an opportunity for BlackBerry. So, so the reason police don't have access to BBM is BBM is encrypted uh, communication. So, the so BlackBerry itself can't read the messages, even if they wanted to. They're just the go-between. So they give one key to to you and one key to me. And we can share uh, a secret that BBM can see the shared secret, but they can't see our key. And so only we can communicate. Um, so mathematically, that's possible. And I could kind of explain it via paint. Um, so if, if you paint, if you put two paint colors together, and then you put two paint colors together, and then you share those paint colors, then you can see um, the colors mutually. Uh, but BlackBerry would not be able to actually ident to separate out what the colors were to be able to work it back together. If that makes sense. Great. Again, well, encryption is hard to explain. <laughs> but you'll have an opportunity to hear more after the other talks because Mark will stick around and you can mob him with your questions then. But until then, Mark, thank you so much. That was a terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you. Really great.